I want to get uh, an, an answer, if you have one, to what you think Pat Cipollone was worried about uh, uh, if Donald Trump went to the Capitol. He seems to think that that would have gotten, he said, we, we will be charged with everything if that happens. But it's not clear to me what is added to the criminality by Donald Trump actually going up to the Capitol. Well, that puts him in the middle of the action. He is not just inciting, but he is aiding and abetting and participating in a violent insurrection, one whose violence he knows about. And when uh, Pat Cipollone uses the word we, like you, I wondered whether that was the royal we, whether he thought perhaps he should have acted sooner, perhaps he was involved with uh, Donald Trump in his planning of these events. It was obvious that it was no surprise to Trump, it was a happy thing, but no surprise, that the people who came to be with him uh, were armed and dangerous. In fact, um, he specifically said, take down the magnetometers so that these guys can come in with their AR-15s. I know they're not going for me. And that was the most stunning and astonishing thing. Who would they be going for? Might it be Mike Pence? the very guy that, that Trump tried to get into trouble by saying that he was a coward after it looked like this mob had gone after Pence, perhaps around the same time as they had erected a gallows. So I don't blame Mr. Cipollone. He may have some Fifth Amendment privileges to assert when he sits down, but there's no Fifth Amendment privilege just uh, to stay home. Uh, and the idea that he has executive privilege is triply defeated. You know, it's defeated by the fact that the current president holds the privilege. It's defeated by the fact that there is a crime fraud exception. It's defeated by the large swaths of waiver that already seem to have occurred. And actually, I can throw in another one. A lot of the conversations were not with the president. Mm -hmm. So he has no legitimate basis for staying away. And he surely doesn't want to be a coward when his uh, you know, somebody like this young woman who was a real patriot had the spine to show up and answer questions, even though she was a loyal Trumper. There could be, uh, I was thinking as, as we were hearing the testimony yesterday about Mark Meadows just gazing at his phone uh, when yeah. the city is burning. Uh, one wonders uh, how many Ginny Thomas messages were on his phone that he was gazing at uh, on January 6th and what that would mean to the Supreme Court uh, to be in, in that, in, involved in that way on January 6th. We've never seen anything like it before. I mean, there is a law, 18 U.S.C. Section 455, that makes it illegal. It doesn't have an enforcement mechanism, but illegal for a justice of the Supreme Court to take part in the case in which his spouse or her spouse uh, looks like they're involved. Well, she was involved in the case in which he was the one and only vote who said that the documents in the archives that showed how involved she was should be suppressed. Eight to one, the court disagreed. So clearly the committee wants to hear from her and she seems to be backpedaling. She said, I'd be glad to come around, but they called her bluff and she said, oh, well, you know, my husband and I are having a tough time now because we're getting threats as a result of the abortion decision. Oh, poor, poor Jenny. I mean, what about the tens of millions of people whose lives are hurt by that decision, which was the result of a kind of cabal in the Supreme Court, but I'm getting ahead of your of, of myself. What, what else? If you, if you had if you had a if you had a minute with your former student Merrick Garland, what would you present to him as the legal highlights of yesterday's hearing? Well, I guess I would say Merrick. I, I hope you watch carefully, and you will see, as I did, the ravings of a man who was desperate by any means possible to prevent the transfer of power. The fact that his first national security advisor, Mike Flynn, took the fifth when they asked, do you believe in the peaceful transfer of power, tells you a lot of what you needed to know about Donald Trump's state of mind. But the fact that, I hope you notice, 
Merrick, the fact that he said that he wasn't worried about these guns going after him, well, that means sure didn't think it was the Antifa group. It means that he had some advanced knowledge of what those guns were for, and surely they were not just for uh, decorous purposes. These people were armed, dangerous, violent, and he fomented them. So I hope you won't be distracted, Merrick, by some people's claims that we don't really know his state of mind, whatever his state of mind was. Keep in mind that even if you genuinely believe that the IRS has stolen $11,780 from you, I use that number because it's familiar from the Raffensperger dialogue, even if you really believe they stole it, you can't break into Fort Knox or lead an armed mob up the stairs of Fort Knox to grab back the money. That's what we seem to have seen. So, Merrick, I hope you look up the, the U.S. Code, uh, the section on conspiracy to defraud the U.S., the section on witness tampering, the section on corrupt attempts to impede an official proceeding, inciting or assisting an insurrection. But, Merrick, you are a great student. You don't need me to remind you of all that. What you need to focus on is how dangerous it would be to let this be held unaccountable, because that would mean surely that no future president would ever have any incentive to obey the law if by violating it, he could hang on to power forever. That's what I guess I would tell him. And then I would say, would you like a drink? <laughs> well, he, uh, he was very lucky uh, to have you as a teacher when he did, uh, and the country would be lucky if he was listening to his teacher tonight. Professor Lawrence Tribe, thank you so much for joining us again tonight.